Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry video will cover general features of elimination reactions. Chapter 8 deals with alkyl halides and how they can undergo elimination reactions, which is a new type of reaction we're going to look at. We'll start with an example with a general alkyl halide. In this example we have a species that has a carbon that has an X which is a good leaving group. Here X is any good leaving group, but for alkyl halides it would be chloride, bromide, or iodide. We're going to classify some of the positions on the alkyl halide. This position here, the carbon that's attached to the leaving group, is going to be called the alpha position. The alpha carbon has the leaving group X. The carbon next to the alpha position is going to be called the beta position, and the beta carbon has at least one proton. When an alkyl halide like this is put in with a base, the base can deprotonate the beta position, and a double bond then forms between the alpha and beta carbons as X leaves. Here's how that works. The base grabs the beta proton. The electrons in the bond between the beta carbon and the hydrogen go to be shared between the alpha and the beta position, and the leaving group leaves. Those three pairs of electrons moving gives an elimination reaction, which gives an alkene that has a new double bond between the alpha and the beta position. There's a new pi bond there, and there's acid-base products that are produced from the base pulling the proton off. The elements of H and X are lost from the starting material. The proton that was abstracted and the leaving group that left turn up in the acid-base products. That's why it's called an elimination reaction, because elements are lost. With an alkyl halide, the reaction is called a dehydrohalogenation because a hydrogen and a halogen are both lost from the molecule. Here's a specific example with a specific alkyl halide and a specific base. So the alkyl halide has the alpha position, which is the carbon that bears the leaving group. The beta position is the position next to the alpha position that has at least one proton on it, and in this case there are two protons. And here is the base. Now in this case we're using this bulky, sterically hindered base because if you remember back to chapter 7, primary alkyl halides like this have a tendency to undergo SN2 substitution reactions, things that can function as bases also sometimes function as nucleophiles. Well, this particular base is bulky, so the odds that it's going to function as a nucleophile are lower. The idea here is that the base used is bulky to try to help minimize competing SN2 reactions. This is one of the things we're going to have to look at when we look at elimination reactions, is that elimination reactions and substitution reactions oftentimes occur together, and we'll have to try to understand how and why that happens and how we can steer the reaction towards one product or the other, and sometimes it's possible and sometimes not. But in this case, the bulky base makes it less likely that this species will act as a nucleophile, and more likely that it'll just act as a base. So here the base grabs the proton off the beta position, the electrons shift to form a new carbon-carbon double bond between alpha and beta, and the leaving group leaves. And that gives this new alkene that has a new carbon-carbon double bond between the alpha and the beta positions. And the base has become a conjugate acid, having picked up a proton. And the leaving group, Br- in this case, has left. Here the elements of H and Br are lost in the alkyl halide. And you can see that over here in the starting materials. We've lost a proton and a bromine. And those turn up in the products in the acid-base product. There's the bromide and there's the hydrogen. Next, we're going to look at a systematic way to predict elimination products. This is going to be important when you solve problems that ask you to predict products and elimination reactions. We'll start here with an example using the secondary alkyl bromide. The first step is to find and label the alpha carbon. This is the carbon that has the leaving group. In this case, the leaving group is a bromide, and the carbon that it's attached to would be the alpha position. Your next goal should be then to find and label all the beta carbons, and these are positions next to the alpha carbon that have protons attached. In this case, we have a beta position on the left, this methyl carbon, and it has three identical protons that could all be abstracted by a base. And there's another beta position over here on the right that's not equivalent, it's a different, because this carbon has one proton attached and two methyl groups. So I've labeled those beta positions with unique identifiers, beta 1 and beta 2, because when they react they give different products. Now the next step would be for each beta position, abstract that beta proton and push electrons to form a new pi bond. We'll first look at beta 1 reacting. So I have here the strong bulky base again, and I'm going to have it first attacking the beta 1 position, plucking off that proton, then those electrons go to form the carbon-carbon double bond, and the leaving group leaves. That gives the alkene shown here, where the alpha and beta positions are labeled. Here we have a double bond between the alpha and beta 1 position, and the beta 2 position didn't react yet. The other products are these acid-base products, where there's the conjugate acid of the base that we used in the leaving group bromide shown here. 
The other possibility is that beta 2 reacts. In this case, the base would deprotonate the beta 2 position. The electrons would flow to form a carbon-carbon double bond between the alpha and beta 2 positions, and the leaving group leaves. I'm showing this in green ink to distinguish it from the red pathway. This gives a different alkene with double bond between the alpha and beta 2 position, and the result of that also produces the same acid and base products. These two alkenes would be produced as products in the elimination reaction. Later on, we're going to study the stability of alkenes, and we're going to learn methods to predict which one of these would be the major product and minor product. For right now, it's just enough to know that these are two possible products. We'll worry about which one is major and minor later. Here's another example that's a little bit more complicated. It has more beta positions. First, identify the alpha position, which is the carbon that has the leaving group, which is shown here. There's a beta 1 position next to it on the left. I'm just going to draw the proton in there to indicate for sure that it's there unambiguously. With skeletal structures, remember, hydrogens aren't always drawn in. So when you get a skeletal structure, you have to be really careful to make sure that you're aware of where the beta positions are and the beta protons and not overlook any. This is probably the biggest problem in predicting elimination products is just making sure that you're careful to find all the beta positions that have protons. Here's a beta 2 position that has three protons on the methyl group and I'm gonna draw out one of those protons and just change that number to a two. The reason I'm drawing out the proton there is later on I will use that bond in the mechanism showing how that elimination reaction happens. And then down here in the beta three position, there are two hydrogens that I will draw in for clarity. The first reaction we'll look at is beta one reacting. The base plucks off the beta one position, the electrons flow to form a new double bond and the leaving group leaves and that gives a new carbon-carbon double bond between the alpha and beta 1 positions, as shown here. The chloride is also produced as a leaving group, as is water, which is the conjugate acid in this case. Now you might wonder here, why am I using a hydroxide base all of the sudden? What happened to the strong, bulky base I was using before? Well, the strong, bulky base would work fine here, but this situation is a little different than the others. Here, we have a tertiary alkyl halide. This chloride is attached to a tertiary carbon. The likelihood that this is going to act as a nucleophile and undergo an SN2 reaction is very, very small. Tertiary alkyl halides don't react under SN2 conditions, so here we don't need the bulky base. This hydroxide base will work fine. There's no danger that this species will act as a nucleophile in this case because we have a tertiary alkyl halide here. So with elimination reactions, as we're looking at them now, you always have to think back to substitution reactions a little bit and keep that in the back of your mind as to what could potentially happen. Could the base that you're using function as a nucleophile? In this case, the answer is no. Let's look at reaction at the beta 2 position. If beta 2 reacts, the base plucks a beta 2 position off, the electrons flow to form a new double bond and the leaving group leaves. That gives a new carbon-carbon double bond between the alpha and beta 2 positions, as shown here. The final possibility is that the beta 3 position reacts. Here, the base plucks a proton off the beta 3 position, the electrons flow to eliminate the leaving group, and that gives a new carbon-carbon double bond between the alpha and beta 3 positions. This example shows how you can have three different beta positions all reacting to give three different alkenes. In the next few slides, we're going to learn methods to distinguish which of these would be major and minor products. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.